You guys are here. I'm glad to have our regulars here today. We have, um, uh, man, the Lord is the Lord is working among us today. Amen. We are. Thank you for the amen. Because we, that, the Lord works anytime we gather. We gather together. The Lord is working amongst us, all around us, and, and in us, and through us. And so I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to open God's word with you guys today. Um, if you want to open to Acts chapter 2, uh, that's where we're going to plant ourselves today. And uh, um, my favorite television show started the new season this Friday. You guys are going to laugh at me when I tell you what it is. I love Gold Rush. Okay, it's on Discovery Channel. I know you can laugh at me. It's 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 fine. I I just enjoy it. It's it's a show. If you don't know about it, it's a show where a bunch of guys go out to Alaska and they, um, and they are on the search for gold. And so they, uh, yeah, okay, we got a couple of fans out here. But we, uh, but that, but we, my dad and I watch it together. So like we'll call each other on. Uh, I didn't. I haven't watched this newest episode, but we'll call each other and talk about. It. I can't believe they did that, or they said, you know, all that kind of stuff. Can you believe they got that much? You know. But basically, they go out and they uh, they dig up. Um, you got land, and they and they and they and they use these big bulldozers and these big excavators, and they use these big machines, and and they and they send this this dirt and, and and all this material through these wash plants, and they're trying to find gold in basically bare land. And so if you look at the land that they're going to, like it's literally just like brush piles, and 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 there's not a lot to it, and and so they'll go out and they'll say, you know, this this land underneath this land is is four million dollars or 20 million dollars or whatever and and the only thing is you just got to go out and find it right and so they go out and they dig these 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 trenches or they dig these these strip mines and and they and they they clear the land and and they start piling all this dirt up and then they start running it through this this wash plant and literally what a wash plant is is a uh, it's a it's a big device that you put dirt in and it shakes all the rocks and it shakes everything and it washes them with a bunch of water and then it sends them through these uh, these 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 ripple the current things that, that separate the dirt and the junk and the water and it puts the gold in deposits in inside of the wash plant so when they talk about it um, they talk about their work as we're going to go wash some rocks wash sh wash some some rocks excuse me I can't talk today and, and basically that's what they do. They go out and they wash rocks and they try to wash all the dirt away and they try to get to the gold, right? And so if you guys were, and this is kind of the funny thing, they, they, they'll go to a new, they call them, uh, they call them, um, um, oh my goodness, what, help me out here. They call them, uh, um, what is it? They call them a claim, but they, a particular place that they're going to dig and they go out and they say, this is where we're going to start digging. And, and so they'll go out to this place and, and literally it'll be full of trees and grass and, 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 and there's a layer of permafrost underneath it. You can't do anything really with this land. It's, it's not really eligible for farming because it's permafrost. So there's, there's, there's ice underneath it and, and, and I'm spending way too much on gold rush. The gist of it is that you, um, this whole sermon is not on gold rush, although I could probably preach a whole sermon on gold rush which not be a Jesus loving sermon but nonetheless it looks like it's useless land but what it's underneath it is is millions of dollars of treasure but all you have to do is go out and work it and wash the rocks to get down to the treasure so when a group of people commit to work the ground and uncover the beauty and incredible, valuable treasure that's buried in this ground you get wealth and you get treasure you get gold. It's and and, and this 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 series the 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 washing of of the rocks and and, and stuff it, it just kind of struck in me as I was going through as we've been going through this series called All In and we've been asking the question of Are you in? Really, we're asking the question. We're 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 looking at commitments that we need to make as a people to uncover the treasure and the beauty of God's church. Really, we're washing rocks. We're washing the rocks of what, it, what commitments it takes for us to be the church that God wants us to be. And I'm not saying that our church is all that far off. In some ways, I'm excited because our church is on the way towards being uh, the kind of church that God wants us to be. We are making commitments. And, and even in this series, we've had people make commitments to, uh, to, 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 be, to say, I'm all in. I'm, and I'm in to serving. And I'm in to studying God's word. And I'm in to giving. And I'm in to all these commitments that 
we've talked about. But I think God gives us a picture, and I, I think it's a beautiful picture of what it looks like when we say, when a church says, yes, I'm all in. One of the things that I, I need to help you, or I need to talk about real quick is understanding that when I say church, a lot of times we get these particular identities or these ideas about what church is. And, and we think, you know, what church is, is this building that we are part of, right? And, and, you know, the church at EHBC, that church is 1309 Clay Street. And we have a collection of buildings on 1309 Clay Street where we do certain things. But that's not what the Bible defines church as. Church is also not an event that you go to. It's not a play. It's not an event that you attend on a Sunday morning or a Wednesday night. I mean, that's something the church does and the church does own property, but that's not what the church is. According to the Bible, the church is the body of Christ. We are an organism. It's, it's everybody that that's, that's calls themselves a Christian in this room. If you truly trust in Jesus Christ and, and you say, I want, to, uh, I want to follow Jesus with my life, then you are a part of God's church. And, and a particular expression of that church is EHBC, East Hartford Baptist Church. We, we gather on Sunday mornings. We gather on Wednesday nights. We have expressions of church throughout the week. But this is the church. And so when we're asking, okay, God, what do you want this church, this people to be? We're saying, what do you want us to commit ourselves to? We get a beautiful picture of what church is in Acts chapter 2. If you want to follow along with me, on that sheet you got in your bulletin as you walked in the door, there, there are some notes on that sheet if you want to follow along with the notes that I have there. But there's also at the top of that sheet, I included the passage today because I wanted us all to have that in our hands for you to write on it or, or, or study it or whatever and take it home and, and, and do your own study. <clears throat> there's a particular group mentioned in the, in, the Acts, in the book of Acts called the Bereans. And what the Bereans would do is when after they heard a sermon, they'd go home and they would study it themselves. And I love to be a church that's about a Berean. They're a Berean church, right? Where, where we go home and we apply it our, to ourselves. We, we go home and we do the study to make sure what the pastor said was in there for sure, right? And so you guys go home be Bereans, okay, this week. That's my challenge to you. Amen? You guys, if you accept that challenge, say amen. amen. All right, be Bereans this week and go home and study that passage, okay? So Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> excuse me, verses 42 through 47. It says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship and to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let me pray. Lord Jesus, God, I do pray right now, Father, that you would help us to understand your passage, God. God, we, you would, in your spirit, Father, through your spirit, God, you would begin to change our hearts, to mold and shape us into your image and to what you would want us to be, God. God, it's not my words. It's not, God, the, the, the environment that we're creating here, Father. It's only your spirit that can change us, God. And there's folks in this room that bring a lot of baggage, a lot of frustration, a lot of things to the table when it comes to church, God. And so we pray right now, Father, that you help us grasp an image of what you intend church to be, God. Not what we want church to be. Not what we, we desire church to be, God. Not what we think church should be, God. But what do you desire us to be as your people? sold out for you and your mission in this world. God, thank you for your grace. And thank you for being with us in this time today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, this passage comes right after Peter had preached what we would assume was the first sermon in the church's history. So in Acts chapter 2, the, the Holy Spirit comes upon the church. The Holy Spirit is God's presence that lives inside of those who trust in Christ Jesus. We, we receive power. We receive uh, the seal of our salvation in the Spirit of God that, that dwells inside of us. And so they just received the Holy Spirit. And <clears throat> after receiving the Holy Spirit, 
Peter began to preach. And, and we don't necessarily know the details. We, we, have the, uh, we have the sermon here, but we don't know. Maybe there was more to it. Maybe there was let me know. No, basically, we have the sermon right here. And Peter preached that sermon. And in verse 41, it says, So those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. We average on Sunday morning about 275 people that come to 300 people that come here on Sunday morning. What imagine next week if God would see fit that he would add 3,000 souls to this church next week. We would, we would have to figure out where we're going to house everybody, right? We're going to have to figure out where all these kids are going to go and all these families are going to go. But it would be a good problem to have, wouldn't it? What amazing problem it would, it would be to have if God would add that kind of church to, or, or that kind of amount of people to us. But you see, what happens right after that, ha right after um, Luke shares that with the, with, with the people, he says, this is what the church was like back then. There were 3,000 or, or, or 4,000. We don't know exactly how many people that he's talking about, but he says that, that you need to get a, catch a picture, a glimpse of what the church was like back then. And so he shares this passage in, in Acts 2, 42 through 47. And we, we get a picture of what I want to call today the vital church. What I mean by vital church, I don't mean, uh, I, I don't mean this to be kind of this, this piffy saying or anything like that, but I believe that the vital church has this, this idea, uh, two kind of, kind of things, right? One of the things is the, this vital church means we, we look at the, this church had what was essential to be a church, right? And when you strip everything away, this is what this church was all about. And that's what Paul, or that's what Luke shares here about what the church was like. But secondly, this vital church was vital to the, to the community that they were a part of. I think God wants us to be a vital church. When I use the word vital, what I mean is the word vital means necessary, for, necessary to existence or to the well-being of something. If you've ever been to the hospital, when you walk into the hospital and they, and they check you in, they're going to check your vitals, right? That's what they call them. <laughs> <clears throat> the vitals inside of a hospital are those things that they check to make sure you're still living. And if, if you are still living, if the things that all these things are indicate whether you're healthy or not. Right. So they're going to check your pulse. Right. So if you have a good pulse, then they say, OK, his heart's beating. If they have no pulse, then they know something's wrong. Right. Or if the pulse is racing really fast, they would know, OK, something's going on. Right. They would check your blood pressure. Right. And some of you have had your blood pressure checked and the doctor said, OK, we've got a problem. Right. Because this is a little too high, or maybe it's way too high, and that's why your head's hurting, and that's why you're all dizzy, right? You guys have been there before. I know some folks have had. So those are our, our, our couple of breathing, right? If somebody comes in and they're not breathing, then the doctor knows, okay, that's, that's vital to your existence. You've got to be able to breathe, right? Or if your body temperature is another vital that they will check. So if it's, if you, if you come in and you have 103 fever, then they know, okay, something's wrong with this person, right? When your vitals are off, when the, the, the essentials to your existence are off, you know that your life could be at risk. And that's exactly what's going on. So we're asking the question, what are the vitals of the church? When I was in, in seminary, I had to write a paper. <clears throat> it was one of the first papers in, in my church planning class. And my, my, my professor introduced the paper. And he says, I want you to write a paper on the irreducible ecclesiological minimum. And I said, okay, well, I have to look all those words up, right? That's what seminary does. It gives you, it makes you real familiar with your dictionary because now I have to look up what all these words mean. <clears throat> but what he was saying is if you were to, re, uh, to, to reduce the church, the ecclesiological there is, is church. What does it mean to be the church? What does the Bible say about the church? So if you were to reduce the church down to its very minimum of what it takes to be a church, what would be left? What would be left? It was an eye-opening project for me because I had, you know, I was, I was, I was headed towards the church planting world. I was going to start a church, and when you start a church, you've got to have the first thing, the most important thing. There's a couple of things that are real important. You got to have a rocking good band, <laughs> right? And you got to have an awesome building to gather in, right? 
and you got to have a really cool preacher. And so I tried to, I got this vest one time. I was going to preach in this vest, like one of those cool trendy vests. And I still have never worn that. We got the tag still on. If anybody wants it, I'll sell it to you for real cheap. But that's, but you got to have like all these factors, right? You got to have a good children's ministry. You got to have, you know, you got to have all these factors, right? That's what it means to start a church. And so he starts asking this question, what's the irreducible ecclesiological minimum? If, but, but so he was asking, okay, if you stripped away all the historical institution of the church, if you were to strip away all the cultural additions to the church, if you were to strip away all the historical practices of the church, if you were to strip away all the human institutions of the church, if you were to strip away all the growth strategies of the church, if you were to strip away all the buildings and the ministries and the events and the programs and everything that we preferences. If we were to strip away all those things, what would we be left with? We would be left with the vitals, right? When you come into the doctor's office, they don't check your hair color. Right? They might check your body weight. That's an important one too. But they're not going to check your hair color. They're not going to check your, 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 your personality. They're not going to check your clothing styles. They might judge you in your clothing styles, but that's not vital to your existence, right? And that's the things we focus on mostly are the things that you see, but not the vitals behind it, right? The real heart issue stuff, the real important things about what it means to be a follower of Christ and what it means to be God's church and God's people in this place. It isn't to say that the ministries and the programs and, the, and, the, and those things are bad things. But it's to say that we, it, when we complicate things, when we overcomplicate things, we begin to lose focus on what's essential, what's vital. So I'm asking the question from this passage, let's wash the rocks, folks. Let's wash the rocks and look at Acts chapter 2 and say, what, what does God want this church to be? What, what, is, what are the vitals of our church family? I want to share four elements of a vital church with you. And what you're going to find is these are going to be real familiar to you if you've been a part of our church for any, any length of time. These are going to not, hopefully they won't be new. Hopefully you won't say, I never heard that before. Because if you have, we're not doing our job real well. If you've been here for more than a couple months. But these are the vital elements of a church, of an elements of a vital church. The first thing is this learning. Being devoted to God, the word of God. If you look at this passage, going back to our, our Acts passage, it, the, the first thing they say here is, and they devoted themselves, <coughs> excuse me, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. See, this is they had it. They had us. They had us kind of one up here a little bit. See, what, when they they we had we have the word of God, right? We have the Bible, and that's that's what the apostles' teaching is for us today. But they literally had the apostles teaching them to follow Jesus. They had Peter. They had John. They had they had. Uh, Thomas, they had all those guys, Matthew, they had all those guys that were following Jesus and walking with Jesus and telling the stories of Jesus and, and, and teaching them the things that Jesus taught them, right? And so they, when they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, what, they're, what they're, they're literally saying is they listened to the apostles and they said, what are the apostles saying? We've got to devote ourselves to what they're saying. We've got to devote ourselves to listening, but not just to listening, but to living it as well, Right? They knew that the Word of God transforms hearts. It, it transforms minds. It, it transforms our character and who we are. They knew that it sharpens, that the, the, the Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, right? They knew that the Word of God is profitable for teaching and for reproof and for correction and for training in righteousness. They knew that. And so they devoted themselves to all the words the apostles were teaching. They said, we've got to commit to these things. Back in, in the, the, like 2008, 2009, there was a study done, and, and I got to be a part of the very end of it at Lifeway Research. And 
It was a book that was written from Brad Wagner right after this. And, and, but they did a survey. About 2,500 per people participated in this survey. And they were basically asking the question, how, what, are the what are churches doing? And how are people, how has someone grow? How does someone grow up in the Lord? How does someone grow spiritually um, and, and mature spiritually? And what can the church, basically they were asking the question, what can the church do to help people to grow spiritually? And, and what they found was, 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 was not that incredibly profound, because we see it right here in this passage. But what they found out of those 2,500% participants, that the number one predictor of spiritual growth was da the daily discipline of Bible reading. Did you realize that? If you want to grow spiritually, if you want to grow up in your faith, the number one factor, the number one indicator of whether you're going to grow spiritually is if you read your Bible on a daily basis. Now, I don't want you to get you, if you read your Bible regularly, over the last couple months, I've talked to a lot of people and I've heard the same thing. And, and I don't mean to say this as a guilt trip by any means. Just listen to my first part of my sermon last week. It's not guilt that I'm trying to, to, to weigh on you that you've got to read your Bible or, or, you'll be, or you'll be a bad person. That's not what it's about. But I do believe this is, this is an indicator of the spiritual health of our church. I've had so many people tell me, you know what, I don't read the Bible that much. Or I haven't really ever read the Bible much at all. And I think that is an indication that we have lost one of the vital signs of our church. If we're not in God's Word, we're not growing in faith. And I realize this sometimes it's hard because we read the Word of God and we don't know where to start. We, re we Maybe we pick the Word of God up and we just don't get anything out of it. I talked about this a few weeks ago. Maybe you read the Word and you don't understand any of the words that are in it. You probably need to get a different translation of the Bible then. King James had, a, it had its place in history, but now it's time to get something you can actually read and understand. The Word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword. The Word of God is breathed out. This is literally breathed out by God, given to us by the Holy Spirit for our edification, for the building up of the saints, for, for our conviction and our, and our growth spiritually, for the answers to, the, to many of life's questions. See, a lot of times we don't, we, 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 our only Bible intake is what I say from the pulpit on Sunday morning. Do you realize there's some weeks I only read one passage of Scripture? Or maybe if I do read a whole chapter of Scripture, that's all you're getting all week. And there's so much in this book that we need to devote ourselves to. We need to read it. We need to study it. We need to meditate on it. We need to fight and figure out how this stuff applies to our lives. And listen, I want to help. There's a lot of people that want to help. So maybe you don't know how to start. I don't even know how to start reading the Bible. If you get out your bulletin, there's a place in the bulletin that has a reading plan. Start there. Just start reading. Come shoot me an email. I'd love to give you some suggestions on where you can start reading in the Bible. Come by my office. We can sit and talk for an hour. We can read the Bible together. I'd love to do that with you. But let's be a church. It's vital. A vital church is a church that is learning about and seeking to follow Jesus in His ways. The second is living. Committed to community. These guys, these ringing a bell, right? If you pick up your, 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 your bulletin, on the front of your bulletin, it has our vision statement. If you go to our website, on the front of the website, it has our vision statement. We are a church that is, is, is seeking to live for Jesus. We're a church that's seeking to learn, him, learn about Him and His ways. We're a church that's seeking to love, right? And we're a church that's seeking to lead others to Him. I'm giving away my other two points, right? That's where this is coming from, right? But if you look at this living, the, look at the passage, it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to what? To fellowship. That word fellowship, this, 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 that word is not like, like, a, like we, we dumb it down and we make it ice cream fellowship. So it's like, oh, well, you know, fellowship means you eat ice cream together. 
or fellowship means that you eat donuts together, or, or fellowship means that you have a place that you, everybody comes together and they have a meal, right? It's all centered around a meal. I don't think that's what they devoted themselves to. Hey, let's devote ourselves to eating ice cream together. Let's, let's devote ourselves to gathering in a place we call a hall, a fellowship hall, and let's do, let's do that on a regular basis, have a list of little potluck. That's not what they intended. They devoted themselves to one another. It, tangibly, it says they were together and had all things in common. They attended the temple together and broke bread in their homes together. They were with one another. They were in each other's lives. See, we can kind of get this romanticized view of what this means. I don't think this means that they never had a conflict. That there's never a, a difference in personality. That there was never this like, oh man, that guy's really annoying. I'm sure there was that. There's always that. That's, that hasn't changed in 2,000 years. Like in the last 2,000 years, annoying people didn't just come out. Like they were annoying back then as well. And so in community, you're going to have people that annoy you and get on your nerves and are just kind of weird and different than you. I'm weird and different. I like a show where they dig holes and find gold in them. Like not all of you are like that, right? And some of you don't like basketball. I still can't figure you out, but at least you're in my community and we love you anyway. And so this saying, they devoted themselves to one another. They were together and had all things in common. That's not mean that they had, they all liked the same sports team. It doesn't mean they all liked the same kind of food. But they, they were committed to one another. There was unity amongst them. You realize there's 54 statements in the New Testament that use the word, the, the Greek word, I lay alone which translates to one another. 54 times in the New Testament, the word I lay alone is used that translates to one another. There's love one another. There's be at peace with one another. Be patient with one another. Confess sins to one another. Serve one another. Bear each other's burdens. Each other and one another, same thing, okay? Just so you know. It's like, oh, that's not a one another. Yeah, it is. Like that's, there's, what, what that's saying to us is if we're going to live as the vital church that God wants us to be, we have to be in each other's lives. It's, you cannot be an autonomous Christian that just comes to a service on Sunday mornings and never has any connection with anybody else. And I know you're connected with your family. I know your mom, your dad, your sister, all that kind of stuff. But, but it's more than that. Our, our relation is not just a blood relation. It's a relation that's connected by Jesus Christ. And we need to connect with other people. It's vital for our existence. It's vital for your existence as a, as, as a Christian. It's vital for our existence as a church that we are connected to one another. Number three, loving, dedicated to serving. <coughs> It says, together they had all things in common. They were united to serve the needs of the community. They were selling their possessions and distributing the proceeds to all as had any need. Back in Romans chapter 12, Paul says that we worship Jesus by presenting ourselves as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to Him. And he goes on to say, this shows up in how we serve other people and how we use our gifts and, and how the Holy Spirit gives us gifts that we are intended to use for the service of His church family, for the service of the common good of the church and the kingdom of God. See, worship and church have become consumeristic endeavors for many of us. See, if you go to Spotify right now and you type in the word worship, a musical style is going to come up. Not a lifestyle, a musical style. And, and we do worship through music. We, the, the, the music allows us to kind of get our, our minds and, and, our, and, our, and, our, and our attentions uh, focused on the Lord and as we sing the words that, that we are presented and as we hear those presented in a, in a musical way, right? And we, we, we do experience God through music. We're able to worship God through music, but we worship God. And one of the ways that Paul has told us that we should worship the Lord is by giving ourselves sacrificially and particularly in service service to other people, particularly in service of using our gifts to serve the body of Christ. 
our devotion to the word, to God's word and our commitments to community lead us to ask the question, where can I serve? Where, what can I do to help? I think a vital church is made of people who, who, who are not looking to mark church attendance off a checklist of things to do. It's, it's, it's a group of people who aren't looking to, 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 to have an experience on Sunday morning, but rather it's a group of people that are willing to give themselves up for the good of the community, the good of the kingdom of God advancing in our place. And that starts from a very early age. We're going to present you guys a need in just a second. And, you know, we, we, we have children right now that are up in, uh, upstairs here in the nursery. And, and we need people to invest in their lives. And we have kids across the street that we need people to invest in their lives and teach them the things about the, 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 the word and teach them about Jesus and to invest in them as, as little people. We have youth across the street, students from 7th grade to 12th grade that need people to invest in their lives. We have adults that are sitting in this room right now that, that, that really what they need is someone to welcome them in and say good morning and, 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 and direct them to the coffee or make sure their kids get to the right place and, and make sure they have a parking place. And We need people to serve and, 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 and running sound in the back or, or, or running our computer. Those aren't vital elements of our church, but the, the heart behind it is vital. That we serve and we sacrifice for the good of the, of, of the community. We need people to visit those that are in need. We need people to give as they've been given so that we can serve those who are not being served. The last one is this, leading, mobilized for mission. Look at the very end of that passage. It says, having favor with all people. That having favor with all people means that what this community was doing and, and the way they were living and, and the community that they were creating, people around them in, in, in the city of Jerusalem and, and those surrounding communities were saying, there's something about those people, man. There, there's something good about what's going on there, right? And, 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 and the cool thing is, like, I hear that in our, in our church, in our, in our community. I, I'll, hear, I'll tell people that I'm a pastor at East Hartford Baptist Church. And this, oh, man, I've heard some really good things about that church. And, and, I, and I say, man, we do have favor in this community, and so I, I, as we're living it out, this, this leading idea, this mobilized for mission is that we have favor in the community. But not only that, the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. A vital church is an attractive community of people. We're attractive. See, they... They were known for the lives they were leading. They, they made an impact on those that they lived around. They knew their neighbors and they shared life with their neighbors and they sought to bring their neighbors into this community, not to a church service alone, but into a community and to express the truths about Jesus. See, we believe I have been radically transformed by the truth that Jesus Christ died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the, from the dead to keep, to, 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 <clears throat> to conquer death and to conquer sin in my life. And, and that brings me incredible amount of hope and incredible amount of, of of joy in my life and, and why would I not want to express that with people that live next to me that family members that, that <clears throat> don't know this truth why would I not want to share that with my co-workers a church mobilized for mission says this is important for everybody to hear let's go and share and they might not listen they may turn their backs on us <clears throat> but we say it's important enough that I must tell people about it and because of the favor and because of their commitment to mission and to going and to telling, the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. What kind of church would... I'd love to see a church. I heard a pastor say this in, 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 in starting a church. He said, um, what would it be like? What, what kind of church would it be like where one person was coming to Christ every day? So at the end of the year, he had 365 new, new people coming to Christ that have came to Christ. <coughs> totally transformed lives. They added 3,000 people to the church in one day. 
It's not about church growth. I don't, I mean, this, this church, I mean, it, we, we are about kingdom growth and, and seeing people's lives transformed because they've met our risen Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What would it look like if we had those coming to faith every day, those who are being saved? See, we're not a church. We don't want to be about building buildings. <coughs> We don't want to be a church about building buildings. We don't want to be a church about having the coolest or, or trendiest uh, uh, you know, uh, staff or, or buildings or, or programs around. It's not who we are. We want to be about making the name of Jesus known in this place and around the world. We want to be about seeing people's lives changed as they give their lives and hearts to Jesus. A vital church is a church whose members embrace the call of God to be on mission in this world. A vital church is a church that sees people come to know Jesus as Lord as they give themselves in service, as they, as they live in community with one another and those around them, and as they learn and grow and, and devote themselves to God and His Word. Let's be that kind of church. And my question has always has been from the very beginning of this series, are you in? Are you in to being a part of a movement of God? As I really believe that's what God wants us to be. He, wants, he doesn't want us to grow as a church and be a really good church. He wants us to be a movement. He wants, we, one of the passages that, that, that always stands out to me, and it says in verse 43, it says, And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. That's a debated passage, but what I want to see is the miracle of marriages that were once broken restored. I want to see people who were once broken and in darkness and in, in, de in depression and, and, and were despised and rejected come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and the joy that's only found in Him. I want to see people healed of their sicknesses. I want to see relationships that have been severed healed because of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what a vital church sees, is the miraculous hand of God in interfering into our lives and transforming them for the good of His kingdom and His glory. So are you in? What would it look like if we were all devoted to God's Word? Being learners, not just listeners. What would it look like if we were all committed to community, true living and true gospel-centered community with one another? What would it look like if we were all dedicated to serving the body of Christ, loving rather than consuming? What would it look like if we were, if we were all mobilized for mission, embracing the call of God for making disciples? I believe EHB, EHBC is a church positioned to be a part of a movement, not just a good church. Today we're going to do something a little different in, as a time of response. We, Andy and I were talking and praying this week about an issue, a, a, a tangible way that we can call you to service. We have a, a problem in our church that we want to share with you guys today and, and we want to call you guys to action on it. And so Andy's going to come forward and he's going to give us a picture um, of, of, of what this problem is and we want to call you guys to action today and so this is again a, a little bit different way to call you to response today. Mm -hmm.